Today we're going to talk a little bit about something called a derangement of a set. And in order to make this a little bit more interesting, we're going to wrap up what we find out about derangements into a pretty interesting looking limit. So let's look at our definition first. A derangement is a permutation without fixed points. So what's a permutation? Well, that's simply a one-to-one -one and onto map from a set back to itself. So if that one-to-one -one onto map doesn't fix any points, then it's called a derangement. Now we're going to define something called the subfactorial of n, which has the notation of, well, exclamation part and then n. And that's defined to be the number of derangements of the set containing one up to n. So in other words, it's the size of the set of all permutations, so in other words, elements of the symmetric group Sn, such that sigma of m is not equal to m for all m between 1 and n. So this ensures that there are no fixed points. Okay, so let's maybe look at some examples first. So we'll just take by definition for n equals 0, the subfactorial of 0 to be equal to 1. And you can think about this as maybe like the empty derangement if you'd like that. And then the subfactorial of 1 is equal to 0. That's because there's only one permutation from the set containing 1 to the set containing 1, and that is simply the identity map, which fixes everything. So if it fixes everything, well, it that means that there's nothing that fixes nothing. Okay, well, so anyway, that's how we get this up here. Now for n equals 2, well, we can easily see that there's the identity map and then the map that switches 1 and 2, meaning that this is our only derangement, so the subfactorial of 2 is 1. Next up, the subfactorial of 3 is 2, because, observe here, everything is fixed. Here 3 is fixed, and the next one 2 is fixed, here 1 is fixed, leaving those two terms over there, not terms, those two maps over there being the only two derangements. Okay, so now that we've got kind of an idea of what's going on, let's work towards this limit. Okay, so we're going to fix some notation. So let's say dn is the set of all derangements of the set containing 1 through n. So it's defined as we have over here, right? Okay, now we'll set little dn to be the size of dn, in other words, the subfactorial of n. But I'm using this d sub n notation just because it's going to be a bit easier to work with. And now our first goal is to find a recursion for d sub n. And we're going to do this combinatorially. So let's suppose we have sigma inside of d sub n. And this is going to kind of naturally break into two cases. So the first case is that sigma evaluated at sigma of n is equal to n. Okay. But then what I'll do now is I'll set sigma of n equal to m and observe that this breaks sigma into two pieces. So notice sigma will send n to m and then it'll send m back to n. So sigma has this loop right here on this set containing m and n. Recall that we know that m is not equal to n because it's a derangement. If m were equal to n, then, well, we would have a fixed point, and we know that we don't have a fixed point. And then the other portion of sigma goes like this. Notice we've got this set 1, 2, up to m minus 1, and then m plus 1 up to n minus 1. And so now sigma maps from this set back to itself. Then, since sigma is a derangement of the whole set, it's a derangement of this set. But how many elements are in this set? Well, I think we can easily count it's n minus 2, because we've taken away m and we've taken away n. We've taken away two elements from an n element set. So right here, you can think about sigma as a derangement in d sub n minus 2. Okay, 
So now, well, let's count how many derangements lie in this first case. So oh, I think this isn't so bad. So there are how many such derangements? We'll observe that there are n minus one places to send n. We can't send n to itself because it's a derangement, we, but we could send n to one, two, three, up to n minus one. And so there's going to be n minus 1 times, well, the number of derangements we get down here, which by our definition is little d n minus 2. And then, well, we're multiplying them because of the multiplicative property. So that means there are n minus 1 times d n minus 2 such derangements. And, well, what do I mean by such derangement? Well, I mean elements of dn that double compose to send n to itself. Okay, so now that we've got this first case taken care of, let's move on to the second case. So we've sorted out this first case, and now we're ready to look at the second case, which is really just not the first case. In other words, what if sigma of sigma of n is not equal to n? Okay, so we're going to start off with a relabeling, and this is just going to make everything maybe a little bit notationally more simple. So let's relabel the numbers 1, 2, up to n so that we have sigma of n equal to n minus 1. And this, then just keep in mind that there are still n minus 1 places that we can send this n. It's just We've relabeled it so that it goes to this, you know, last possibility. But in the end, when we employ the multiplicative property of counting again, we'll use the n minus 1 choices for sigma of n. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so now let's define a companion map that's going to be built out of sigma. So I'm going to call this a sigma hat, and what it's going to do is it's going to go from 1 up to n minus 1 to itself. Well, and hopefully it's a derangement because that'll allow us to do some counting here. And how will it be defined? Well, I'm going to say a sigma hat of k is equal to sigma of k if we have sigma of k not equal to n. And then, well, it's going to be n minus 1 if sigma of k is equal to n. Okay, well, let's note that this definitely makes a derangement of this set. But maybe this is a bit complicated to look at, so let's do an example where we start with a sigma and produce a sigma hat. So let's say sigma acts on this set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I'm just going to define it via these arrows. So let's say sigma takes 1 up to 5, and then it'll take 2 to 1, 3 to 2, 4 to 3, and 5 to 4. So let's get those arrows in there, and like I said, that's going to be our definition of sigma. So let's maybe put a little bubble around that just to point out that that is defining our sigma. And then out of this rule, well, well, let's notice that sigma of sigma of 5 is not equal to 5. In fact, well, it's going to be equal to 3. So that means we are in this case. And, well, let's look at what this sigma hat is. So it should be defined on the set 1, 2, 3, 4. And what it does is it takes 1 to 4 because 1 originally gets sent to 5. Now it's going to be sent to 5 minus 1. And then everything else will be sent to the same place. So 2 to 1, 3 to 2, and 4 to 3. So let's see. 1, 2, 3. So this is our defining rule for our sigma hat. Okay. So let's maybe take a step back and see what we've done here to count up this second type. Well, observe that we started out with n minus 1 choices for where to send sigma of n. It might look confusing over there because it says it's going to n minus 1, but remember we did a relabeling there. 
And then once we made one of those n minus one choices, we were able to produce a derangement on this smaller set. This set containing one to n minus one. And we know how many derangements are on that set. It's d sub n minus one. So putting this all together, what do we know? We know that there are n minus one times d n minus one such derangements of this type. Okay, great. So now let's put this all together to give ourselves a recursion. Okay, so we worked with these two cases, these two cases that are most definitely disjoint, and they produce all possibilities for derangements of one to n. And so, well, what does that mean? So that means that we can pull out our recursion pretty easily. It'll just be the sum of the types from each of these cases. Well, look at that. That's going to give us dn is equal to n minus 1 times dn minus 1 plus dn minus 2, where, you know, I've done some factoring there. Okay, so now we've got a recursion for dn. Let's see what we can do with that. Okay, so now starting with this recursion that we just spent some time constructing, um, we're going to do a bit of a calculation. So let's look at d sub n minus n times d sub n minus 1. And what will that be equal to? Well, I think it's pretty easy to see that that's equal to minus d n minus 1 uh, plus n minus 1 times d n minus 2. So something like that. But now let's observe that the left hand and the right hand side of this equation look pretty similar. It's just the index on the right hand side of the equation has been lowered by one and we've introduced a minus sign. So you can maybe see that more clearly if we factor a minus sign out and you see that we have dn minus one uh, minus uh, n minus one times dn minus two. Now these two sides match, if you will. But now what we can do is just apply this recursion over and over and over again. So let's see, next, well, the minus sign is going to turn into a plus, and we're going to be left with dn minus 2 minus n minus 3 times dn minus 4. And then again, if we do it one more time, it's going to turn back into a minus, and we're going to have minus uh, dn minus 3 minus n minus 4 times dn minus 5. And then, well, we continue this on and on and on until we end up at the bottom keeping in mind that the subfactorial of zero, in other words, d sub zero is one, whereas the subfactorial of one, d sub one is zero. And well, we're gonna end up with this, minus one to the n times minus d one plus d zero, in other words, minus one to the n, because of that initial condition that I just talked about. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. We've got this dn minus n times dn minus 1 is minus 1 to the n. Let's see what we can do with that. So I just moved some things around, but this is where we ended up essentially. We've got d sub n is equal to n times d sub n minus 1 plus minus 1 to the n. But now what we'll do is introduce a factorial here. So I'm going to divide both sides by n factorial. That's going to give me d sub n over n factorial is equal to d sub n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial plus minus 1 to the n over n factorial. So you might say, well, why did I do that? Well, now it all looks pretty similar because of how the n and the n factorial cancel down to this n minus 1 factorial. Furthermore, it allows us to apply this recursion over and over and over again. So let's expand it. Well, the first time we'll take this term right here, our dn minus one term, and well, use the recursion that we have to expand it. That'll give us dn minus two over n minus two factorial plus minus one to the n minus one over n minus one factorial. And then bringing this down, we have minus one to the n over n factorial. And then, well, we can expand this dn minus two over n minus two factorial and so on and so forth until 
Well, we get all the way down to the ground, if you will. And we're gonna end up with something that looks like this. So it'll be one minus one over one factorial plus one over two factorial minus one over three factorial all the way up to plus minus one to the n over n factorial. So again, that's from expanding this term over and over and over again with our recursion. But now we can put this together and we'll have the sum as k goes from zero up to n of minus one to the k over k factorial. Okay, so that's actually a really good spot to be because now we can work at our goal limit over here. So this is where we just ended up. Our dn over n factorial was this partial sum of minus one to the k over k factorial from zero to n. Now I'm just gonna remind myself that this d sub n was our subfactorial. So let's go back to this notation. We have the subfactorial of n over n factorial. But look, that's just the reciprocal of what we wanted to have in our limit. So that means we can take our goal limit just by, well, taking the reciprocal of this. So let's see, we've got n factorial over the subfactorial of n. So that'll be equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of one over our sum as k goes from zero up to n of minus one to the k over k factorial. Again, just by taking the reciprocal of both sides of this equation that we just finished building. But now, well, we can just take this limit inside, turning that finite sum to an infinite sum, and we'll have one over the sum as k goes from zero up to infinity of minus one to the k over k factorial. But hopefully that's a recognizable sum. Notice that that's exactly e to the minus one because giving us one over e to the minus one for the value of our limit, which can obviously be simplified to e. So there we have it. Another appearance of Euler's constant e, this time as the limit of the factorial over the subfactorial. And that's a good place to